Today, Square Enix's president stated that its Japanese studios shouldn't try to make games for the West. Is he onto something or limiting the future prospects of the Japanese publisher? Good morning, good Tuesday morning to you. I'm Shane Satterfield from Sifted, and this is Good Morning Gaming for April 19th, 2022. If you'd prefer to consume the show the way it's intended, in a podcast feed so you can listen on your phone as you get ready for work or your commute, head to patreon.com sifted and drop us a pledge. It's free on our YouTube channel for everyone else. You can find our flagship show, Game Face, by searching your favorite podcast service. Please give the show a review if you can. It makes a big difference for us. Square Enix's president, Yosuke Matsuda, has been making a lot of headlines lately. Whether he's extolling the virtues of the blockchain or convinced that players will be creating expansions to his games in the future, not everything he says gets a lot of positive feedback. He struck again today by stating that Square Enix's Japanese studios shouldn't try to imitate Western developers. In a new interview with Yahoo Japan, Matsuda explained that while it's vital that Square Enix's games sell well on a global scale, it would be a mistake if its Japanese developers tried to imitate the Western style of games. Quote, The domestic market, he's talking about the Japanese market, used to be big, but now it is behind China and the U.S., If you are not recognized globally, you are not in business. But interestingly, if Japanese developers try to imitate Western games, they cannot make good ones. The designs of the monsters and the visual and audio effects are all still somewhat Japanese, and players around the world know that this is what makes Japanese games good. End quote. There is a lot that I disagree with here. First of all, It's not the monster designs and visual slash audio effects that make Japanese games good. In fact, many could argue the Japanese developers have fallen a good bit behind their Western counterparts when it comes to visual and audio effects. Really, it's their tone, their foreign, almost alien feel, their unique approach to gameplay, and risky art styles and subject matter that really set them apart. Their games are just different, and that's what makes them good. And secondly, he says that when Japanese developers try to make Western games, that they're not good. From Software would like to have a word. The more it's westernized its games, the more successful they've become both critically and financially. Of the top 20 selling games of 2021 in the United States, Japanese developers created six of them. That figure was exactly the same in 2020. It's not a huge number, but it's not insignificant either. Capcom is a great example of a Japanese developer being very successful creating games for the West. Matsuda is only speaking for Square Enix when he says Japanese studios fail at making Western games. It's really the Japanese games that don't try to conform to the West that generally sell poorly here. Even high-profile wacky exclusives like No More Heroes 3 barely make a dent in the charts in the U.S. and Europe. One thing Matsuda does get right is that the Japanese market has fallen behind both the West and China. Making any sort of big picture decisions based upon that market is foolish and merely for a sense of pride. This is a case where Japanese business traditions can hold back a company's potential. The top selling game in Japan for 2021 was Monster Hunter Rise and it sold just two Point three million copies. That would be a monumental flop in the U.S. and Europe for a big budget game. Granted, the top 50 selling games in Japan were almost all developed in Japan, but their sales numbers are minuscule. If there's one of Square Enix's Japanese studios that has been trying to westernize its games, it's Luminous Productions. Originally, it was a team behind the admittedly underwhelming Final Fantasy XV, But since, it's shifted gears to a decidedly Western-styled open-world action RPG called Forspoken, and I think that game looks pretty cool. The good news for Square Enix is that it does have several Western studios that are creating games for Western audiences. There's the Tomb Raider reboot franchise, Life is Strange, Marvel's Avengers, and Guardians of the Galaxy. They were all handled by developers in North America and Europe. The problem is that most of them have not sold especially well. They say the definition of insanity 
is doing the same thing over and over again while expecting different results. And at what point is Square Enix deemed insane? There are no boundaries anymore. Cultures are more accepting of the ideas of other cultures than ever before. Drawing lines around the acceptance of art is foolhardy on the part of Matsuda, and until he changes his way of thinking, Square Enix is going to continue to rely on mobile and Final Fantasy XIV to drive its revenue. And now for a couple more stories from the top of your sifts. We've went after Battlefield 2042 pretty good here on GMG, and for good reason. It's earned the criticism, but it's only fair that we mention when it does something positive, and today, finally, VoiceOver Internet Protocol, aka Voice Chat, for both parties and squads, has finally launched with Update 4.0. A lot more is coming as well. Weapons attachments have been overhauled, and numerous quality of life improvements have launched like vehicle balancing. According to DICE, there's another update coming in May, but it's highly unlikely incremental changes like Update 4.0 is going to turn the tide for this sinking shooter. Ark Survival Evolved is one of the most popular games for kids this side of Fortnite. The open world dino survival game includes two things kids love, building and dinosaurs. Its launch on Switch was abysmal, but perhaps seeing the potential market on Nintendo's handheld has convinced its developer to completely rebuild it just for the platform. The Ultimate Survival Edition is almost complete, and the game will relaunch this September. A brand new expansion will launch alongside the update. Rumors have been swirling that Game Boy games are coming to Nintendo Switch Online, and today, a list of tested games has leaked. Spanning the Game Boy, Game Boy Color, and Game Boy Advance generations, 40 games appear on the tested list, but that does not mean that all 40 of them will ultimately be released for Nintendo Switch Online. Highlights include two Castlevania games, two Golden Sun games, all the Mario Sports games, F-Zero Maximum Velocity, two Metroid games, two Mega Man Battle Network games, and much more. Currently, each game is a separate app, and software heavily favors the GBA with just a smattering of Game Boy and Game Boy Color games. No idea when all this stuff will be officially announced. According to Deadline, a Streets of Rage movie is in the works. After the massive success of the Sonic movies, Sega is going back to the well one more time with DJ2 Entertainment for an adaptation of this beat-em-up franchise that was born way back in 1991. The creator of John Wick has reportedly signed on to the project as screenwriter, which means it's likely going to be a gritty interpretation. In other video game movie news, Jason Momoa will reportedly star in the Minecraft movie, perhaps the most perplexing of all the video game movie projects. The Hollywood Reporter claims that Jared Hess of Napoleon Dynamite fame has signed on as the film's director. The film has languished in pre-production for years and was almost in full production as far back as 2018. Hess is the fourth director who is committed to the project and hopefully the last. Minecraft developer Mo Yang said the movie will center on a teenage girl and her unlikely group of adventurers. After the malevolent Ender Dragon sets out on a path of destruction, they must save their beautiful blocky overworld. Kind of sounds like Stranger Things? <laughs> Steve Carell was originally tapped as the lead actor as far back as 2016. Let's take a break, and when we come back, we'll tackle today's boss fight. Welcome to today's boss fight, where I tackle random topics that may or may not be related to video games. So the play date reviews are in. You may not remember it. It's this little crazy handheld that has a crank on the side of it. Yes, a crank. The cool thing about it is that the games are released in batches, and there will be a total of 21 games available for season one. The handheld screen is gray and black like the original Game Boy, and as I said, it includes a crank on the side that you actually use to play games. When we first saw it, we thought you used the crank to charge it up like a ham radio. <laughs> the biggest complaints in the reviews is that it can be hard to see the screen in certain lighting. 
Some critics also shared that it can be uncomfortable to play for extended play sessions. Those issues aside, most have glowing things to say about it and recommend a purchase even at its rather steep $180 price tag. This comes on the tail end of mostly positive reviews for Valve's Steam Deck handheld. The portable PC comes in three different configurations, which has made finding a consensus difficult, but most outlets agree that it has great possibilities, but perhaps it launched a bit too early. Still, most recommend it for purchase, even though its cheapest option is a whopping $400. So did I catch that right? Are there two video game handhelds that launched in the last month that are being recommended by most critics? What happened to handhelds being dead? What happened to Nintendo being the only company that could have a successful handheld in 2022? Why did Sony bail on this space? Should it reconsider? The answer to that is a big fat no. Let's not get too excited here. Look at each of these handhelds. The play date is basically an OG Game Boy that provides a steady stream of simple monochrome games. The subscription model is a cool idea that will create plenty of mystery around the handheld, but this hardware really exists for video game development hobbyists. The Playdate SDK is completely free for anyone to download, and once you've created something for it, you can sell it yourself, submit it to official channels, or just give it away for free. There's even a developer's forum where you can rub elbows with other people working on the quirky handheld. Then there's Steam Deck. Its big selling point is that it launches with well over 700 compatible PC games, and many of them you already have in your Steam library. Even its weakest variant is the most powerful gaming handheld ever released. It's also the most expensive, but players have a massive library out of the gate. So what do the two have in common? They're both providing a service that's in demand. In the case of Playdate, it's a simple platform that pretty much anyone can develop for. It's a great way to figure out if game development is something that you're truly interested in. It's like a training wheels for Unreal Engine or Unity. In the case of Steam Deck, it's maximizing the case use of products that millions of consumers already own. Will I go back to the computer room to play an indie game? Not likely. Will I play that same indie game on my couch using Steam Deck? Probably so. Both products are filling voids that players want filled. Which brings us to the potential of another handheld from Sony or something from Microsoft. Both are extremely unlikely because they would lack a unique selling proposition or USP. Sony already tried the whole, hey, let's release crappier versions of our games on a handheld and it didn't go over too well. Microsoft has never publicly expressed interest in launching a handheld and its strategy is making games playable on any device and not necessarily manufacturing those devices. So don't let this little resurgence fool you. The glory days of the PSP and Vita aren't coming back. Instead, we get products we can actually get excited about because they're satisfying both the wants and needs of players. Thanks for listening to Good Morning Gaming. I appreciate you for listening to Good Morning Gaming. I'm Shane Satterfield. Follow me on Twitter at Dinfire and follow Sifted at Sifted Games. And while you're at it, head to patreon.com slash sifted and drop us a pledge. The show will be back tomorrow, but until then, seize today, because there will never be another.